Joyce Bergman, who was a long time Madison resident, had an interesting association with many people and institutions in the city. I am Ruth Doyle. Mrs. Erdman, you can start by giving us a brief biographical sketch of yourself. Where did you come from? How did you happen to be in Madison? Well, Ruth, I was born and brought up in Washington, D.C., and uh, went to high school there and so forth. Then uh, went to Middlebury College for uh, two years, and at that time, I entered Middlebury in 1942, and at that time uh, the war was going on, and uh, uh, after two years in Middlebury, uh, I felt uh, the situation was just a little uh, too dull, and we, we were up in the mountains and kind of out of the whole situation. But beautiful. But beautiful, of course. But uh, So I actually it was after about a year and a half. I left Middlebury and went back to Washington and got a job with the Bureau of Labor Statistics and uh, in my off hours volunteered with the Red Cross and did a lot of work in the local hospitals because they didn't have enough nurses, which is eventually getting around to how I came to Madison. And uh, at the Bureau of Labor Statistics in the Department of Labor, and Francis Perkins was still secretary, I discovered that everyone worshiped the University of Wisconsin. And uh, this is uh, where I had to go when I resumed my college education, which I did uh, later in 1944. And uh, I, I uh, uh, enrolled here at the university and uh, took my major in labor uh, economics. Can I interrupt you just a yes, of course. All right. So I uh, was uh, I enrolled in labor economics and my major professor was Selig Perlman who was one of the greats in uh, formulating economic, labor economic policy throughout the, the country, in a sense throughout the Western world. At any rate, it was a great privilege to be working under and with uh, Professor Perlman. So I took uh, two years with him, graduated in 46 and then went on to get my master's in labor economics the following year and started on my doctorate but uh, uh, by that time the uh, problems of, of being married and having a residence far away from my husband would have been too great so I stayed here in Madison and gave up the doctorate. Uh, after I finished uh, well, well Martin, my husband Marshall and I were married while we were in school and in those days it was just following the war it was very difficult to find housing so Marshall who was rather handy uh, worked uh, built his own house or our own house and uh, in a sense this is how he started in residential construction because once he had hired a few people to help him, he had to keep them busy. And so he uh, wow. built another house, and he found uh, that by selling these houses, he could make enough to support us. Uh, while I helped him a great deal in those days, uh, keeping the books and helping out in design and the landscaping of the houses, I uh, nevertheless had plenty of time to get active in community affairs. And so I joined the League of Women Voters in 1947, and it was in this group that I think I made my lifelong friends. In fact, it was with the League of Women Voters, Ruth, that I met you, and I became reacquainted with a lot of university faculty, but on a totally different level. I see that's true of many of us. Yes. I was on the radio committee at 
so the best part of that's 80 miles from Fran I knew Francis but Francis Hurst yeah. indeed and it, it was a very uh, heady experience I think for people young people youngsters in a sense just out of school to meet faculty members on a social level and it was very exciting and very stimulating uh, Elizabeth Brandeis E.B. whom we had I had had courses from in the university uh, uh, w was a member of the league and very active Walter Morton's wife uh, was very active he was a superb economist who taught money and banking then there is another uh, faculty member uh, uh, William Gorham Rice and his wife Rosman Rice Rosman Elliot Rice the daughter of the president of Harvard and uh, meeting Ro meeting uh, this couple meeting Rosman especially was a rare privilege because she was a very talented woman who had a great deal to offer there was a group that I joined that grew out of the League of Women Voters uh, which was dedicated to supporting the League of Women, the uh, United Nations, which had just been uh, started uh, during the war and was was in its infancy in those days in 47, 48, and this was the embryonic uh, association for the support of the United Nations, something of that nature. That's not quite the right. No, Bill Rice had been with the League of Nations then in Yes. Yes in Geneva yeah long, long and so uh, they especially were dedicated to this concept of world peace through world organization so uh, uh, all of us and as you say Julie Miles uh, oh good enough yeah. everybody uh, th their names escape me but Harriet Morris another uh, non-faculty member but uh, long time supporter of League League of Women Voters programs and uh, uh, a child of Madison who was very active in, in environmental movements which were not called that at that time her father had helped build the Colonel Jackson had helped build the uh, Arboretum in the early days so that meeting these people was a marvelous experience for someone who was extremely impressionable and I, I remember how nice they were the young people extremely they included nice. us in their parties and uh, they just went out of their way to be pleasant and cordial also at this time I uh, helped out in the DOC which you may remember Ruth the Democratic Organizing Committee and your husband Jim had just uh, was the was the main uh, man who who organized this group which was to be a, a revitalized democratic party different from the party in Milwaukee which was an old old timers rather uh, hand out the favors as one can uh, sort of organization and which had absolutely no ability to really fight the Progressive Party or the Republican Party it was the Democratic Organizing Committee which took all the young returned veterans and the uh, the the people who would work for a new kind of Wisconsin political organization and Jim Doyle was the head of it and they needed all kinds of people who would work at the very low levels uh, licking envelopes and, and putting stamps on and, and helping to get out the word to a growing faithful the Democratic Organizing Committee also probably came out of the of the American Veterans Committee the AVC and that had a group of people uh, mm -hmm liberals oh my yes uh, Horace Wilkie was very active in the ABC I remember Gaylord Nelson was active uh, 
I know in the DOC, Miles McMillan was on the fringes, but as he was a reporter for the Cap Times, he was probably not actually active himself. But he was influential in helping to determine policy. So I had uh, uh, an awfully good time working up in some of the little flea bag uh, offices that the DOC was able to rent for or, or be given for practically nothing a month. And it was there that we had a, a, a slight kind of headquarters which would be open a few hours a day. And Harriet Morris and I and a few others were down there as much as we could be and uh, getting the word out. Uh, at the same time in the late 40s, uh, I got a part-time job uh, working in the Dane County Courthouse. And that was interesting because I, it was because I learned so much uh, about how county government was run, and I was in the financial end of it, and the whole concept. What kind of a job was it? It was, uh, there again, a very lowly job, because a, a master's in economics didn't uh, mean much of anything from a pragmatic standpoint of uh, being able to uh, do much besides hunt and peck and the typewriter. So that uh, what I did was work with assessments and make sure that figures were correct and, and transpose this kind of thing here and there. On the other hand, it was an invaluable experience in understanding the, uh, the ins and outs of county government and how county government worked with the various municipalities within its jurisdiction. Oh, which was very mysterious to us. <laughs> which is very <laughs> mysterious and still may be somewhat <laughs> mysterious today. During this period, uh, I also uh, uh, had uh, children, and this was in the early 1950s, and uh, uh, Marshall and I had four children, and uh, while they were all uh, extremely close together, uh, it was almost simultaneous. <laughs> it almost seemed that way, but uh, it, I, I was able to get lots of help from northern Wisconsin. There were many farm girls who wanted to see the big city of Madison. And while my outside work diminished somewhat, I uh, found I was more and more interested in, in subjects that demanded uh, some kind of thought. Because uh, in the early 50s, it seems to me, the, the McCarthy hearings were going on. And the ferment that uh, that uh, the political life had, had caused. Uh, actually, I had been uh, somewhat active in the race that put McCarthy uh, in the seat. Mm -hmm. who, who was the political science professor? His name escapes me. Uh, who, who ran on the Democratic... Was it Nick something? He ran on the Democratic ticket and took uh, took the votes away from Bob LaFollette, the progressive, so that an outsider, he ran up, maybe he ran on the, an outsider, McCarthy, was elected, whom no one knew or wanted, a judge from Appleton. At any rate, uh, McCarthy, Howard McMurray. Howard McMurray. And McCarthy soon proved himself a absolute devastation to Wisconsin. We actually couldn't talk about anything else for about three years. Oh, uh, the, the anti... No, we all, this is exactly, you're right, talked only about McCarthy because his anti-communist platform and attack was so virulent that it hurt so many people, just so many people, and we all knew in Wisconsin how false he was and his approach was. And so we had to take the blame. We took the blame. And we well might, I'm afraid. I kept up, during this period, I kept up my Democratic Party interests, and uh, the DOC by now was expanding, as you well know, and, and uh, I've forgotten, maybe you can remind me, when the first uh, 
Democrat of any substance was elected. Was it uh, Tom Fairchild? Tom Fairchild, and he he 19. was one of the tri uh, triumphant. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, I think, uh, Tom and Jim Doyle and uh, Gaylord Nelson who were the founding three of the DLC. And they had some old timers like Jerry Fox. Oh yes. And yes. Bob Smith. And yes. That stuck with some right. people that helped. Yes, they did. And survive. and that that's true. So that Milwaukee was not completely left out and we, we found them over in Milwaukee. And I remember we had a number of of meetings in which we would meet halfway at uh well the the Red Circle Inn or the Maximilian House, but at any rate, we would drive over halfway to Milwaukee and they would come over and that was very carefully planned. Mm -hmm. So that... Uh, Henry Rice. Henry, of course, was excellent. Well, and uh, there were a number of good Democrats over there, but they weren't organized nearly as much. I remember Albie Houghton was a good... Albie and Jenny Houghton were very good friends of ours who were active in the Democratic Party, but really more our Democratic Party here in Madison, which, of course, the DOC tri uh, tried to be statewide, and in a few years it was. Witness, as you say, the 1948 election of Tom Fairchild. But we, we had a, a long way to go. I remember Jim ran, Jim Doyle ran, and then, of course, uh, Bill Proxmire came in from from Illinois, I think that, yeah, where he came from originally and was determined he knew how to get elected, which was ring doorbells and uh, mm -hmm. not count too much in the party, and he did get elected to Congress uh, from the 2nd Congressional District. Uh, let me see. Uh, we, we know about the Unitarian Church, and, and there again, uh, in the Unitarian Church, uh, I, I was, my husband and I were both members of it, and we found there were the same group of liberals that we had already gotten to know, the Rices, the Rauschenbushes, the uh, Groves, Harold and Helen Groves, who were... Uh, leaders in the congregation and who wanted very much to build uh, a Frank Lloyd Wright structure, uh, a church that would really be something exceptional, that would express the, the onward and striving spirit of the Unitarians, but would not cost that so, so much and would, of course, be designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. Well, because bids came in way too high from the conventional contractors, they turned to my husband because they had known him uh, through uh, social, uh, various social functions here in Madison and turned to Marshall and he uh, was able to, uh, to work with the members and have them do a lot of stone hauling and this and that. How exciting. That was an exciting period and very exciting for him to to work with the uh, the great architect, to work with the Taliesin Fellowship, and get to know something of the philosophy uh, that all entailed. And I'm sure uh, Marshall will be the first one to admit that this Unitarian Church contract was the greatest thing that ever happened to him, because he was on his way and no he place to go but up. no place to go but up and he was so inspired by working with a genius that uh, he, he 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 just started to work hard though he might have said that he did before meanwhile the we had a republican governor uh, it was before Rennebaum who appointed Rebecca Chalmers Barton to the head the, to be the executive director of the Governor's Commission on Human Rights. The Governor's Commission. No, no, it was uh, long before Mr. Knowles. It was uh, 
uh, Oscar Rennebaum, but Oscar Rennebaum took over as governor of the state of Wisconsin from the previous Republican governor who had been office in office just a few months and died. Governor Goodland. Governor Goodland. Governor Goodland before he died was instrumental in getting a commission on human rights called the Governor's Commission on Human Rights composed of about 35 men and women who were going to, on a voluntary basis, ensure that the, the coming sense of human rights for all peoples would be well recognized here in Wisconsin. And so uh, when Governor Goodland died and Oscar Rennebaum, the vice governor, was made, the lieutenant governor, that is, was made governor, he uh, uh, had a certain inspiration that it would be a little better to have some kind of staff. And so he appointed uh, Becky Barton as executive director of this Commission on Human Rights inasmuch as she was the wife of a sociology professor and uh, quite a sociologist in her own right and I don't know what he expected of Mrs. Barton but at any rate she was a real more than he, asked for. he got a great deal more than he asked for and you're absolutely right and I think his eyes were were popping and he was astounded but uh, even a little chagrined much of the time. So the first thing Mrs. Barton did was to try to get studies going in the state of Wisconsin to see what was the status of human rights for all our minorities. And uh, simply because I think because I had known Becky Barton and because that's right. She was part of the League, and I had known uh, her in the university at one time or another as a lecturer. So she uh, asked me if I would work on doing a study on Indians in Wisconsin. And in the early 50s, I began that, uh, which was really quite a, a research project, a great deal of, of well, I'd say fun, but a great deal of work, but such challenging work that I uh, uh, couldn't believe uh, that no one else had done it, had put together what the, what the known facts were about our Indians. There, there, were, there were all these different tribes in Wisconsin, but uh, some were under, directly under federal control. Some, as the Menominees, had a rather interesting uh, non-federal let's see is, is something happening over here oh uh, right any do interrupt because I, I can go on and on in, in directions that may not be Uh, the, the, the research I did, uh, simply entitled Indians in Wisconsin, was revised once. I revised it once about 10 years after. I think the first one came out in about 1954-55, first issue. Uh, and the second booklet came out about 10 years later. But uh, what, what I tried to do was not to, obviously, any judgmental work on the Indians, but I went around to all the known reservations. For example, over in the eastern area, north of, of Green Bay, there's a, a settlement of what they call Mole Lake Chippewa, and they're far separated from the regular settlement of the Chippewa over in the Lac de Flambeau and, and Coup d'Array reservations. But I went around to all the different so-called reservations, which as we all know are, are not in any way uh, uh, denoted by boundaries that are visible in any sense, but are simply 
probably much poorer areas than the than the poor uh, uh, non-Indians who live surrounding them. The Potawatomis live way up north, deep in the forest. The uh, Oneidas over toward Green Bay. Oh, uh, uh, then there are some other Chippewa in the western part, even beyond the Lac de Flambeau and Coup de Ray. And then, of course, there are the, the Winnebago, which are scattered down from from Black River Falls down toward Portage, mm -hmm. all along uh, uh, a whole the little area. Yes, the whole little area in there, but but scattered with no reservation whatsoever. So by going to all these different locations, talking to the tribal heads, if there were, but there were tribal heads, but they weren't extremely, they weren't terribly well organized. And they, they had so many problems. On not one reservation was there an Indian lawyer or an Indian doctor or in many cases, unfortunately, even a, a non-Indian lawyer or doctor or, or anyone uh, in, the, in, in the way of finance. There was up in the, in the Coup de Ray reservation, and I think that it's still going today, a, a, the, the only industry going in, in any part of the of the Indian locations in Wisconsin, that is uh, an electric, the Simpson Electric Company had been established in about 1950, and it was a great boon to the Couture Indians in that it was able, to, this Simpson Electric Company uh, really worked out beautifully because it was able to give jobs to the Indians in that area and give them a sense of their own worth and and uh, one could easily see that it was a it was a more prosperous area than the other Indian areas. In a way, the Menominee was sort of like that. The Menominee and a lumber business. They had a lumber business, and it was run by the Bureau of Indian Affairs, but it was not being run very well, and. Uh, uh, they, they had so many problems. I mean, the, even, even uh, I'm including the Menominees, they didn't have uh, doctors or lawyers or anyone, any professional people in their reservations. And it was the, the BIA, the Bureau of Indian Affairs people who came in, who managed the mill, who told the Indians what to do, who told the women to go out and cut down the, uh, what is it? A, a certain uh, shrub, I can't think of the name of it is, which, which, which infects the white pine and causes it to, it to die before its time. Uh, and uh, at any rate, the, the, uh, later on in the uh, late 50s or early 60s, the Menominee sued the, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the U.S. government for mismanaged mismanagement of their mill, maintaining that they uh, should have been uh, recompensed and should have received uh, a great deal more and should have received a higher percentage of the profits, and they did. That actually the government had milked them and by mismanagement had not done as well as they should have in in uh, working out the plan of of sustained yield and, and uh, cutting on a more this, rational this basis. This the first time that any, any uh, uh, assessment had been made of these various... Well, it was indeed the first time. Also, part of not only discovering what the present situation of the different reservations and different tribes were, I tried to discover the, and this was a little difficult, the relationship of the federal government, of the state government, which was in a ne never, never land, very gray area, uh, and the local governments with the Indian tribes. The state government, for example, more or less kept their hands off the Indian tribes, except 
they made the Indians hew, uh, follow all state laws. And it wasn't until much, much later that the Indian tribes were well enough organized to demand that the treaties, especially the treaty, I believe, of 1855, up in, uh, uh, up in, uh, yeah, up here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah
uh, in a national contest called uh, the Indian Princess. And uh, she was chosen, and She's she she girl. was a lovely girl, and Ada Deer, <laughs> well, we, we were, a uh, number of us were down there at the Capitol applauding her, and she won, and she was whisked off to Hollywood. And this was a great thing, and after that, Ada came back to the Menominee Indian Reservation, and had, having seen the wider world, in from a really wonderful mother, but from extremely poor circumstances, Ada went to college here in Madison, did very well, and is now a lecturer in sociology, as I recall, on Indian affairs. She was the uh, spearhead of the movement that made Menominee a county. Oh, yes. Well, that, that was an interesting uh, period, which... Uh, at, at that time, I was doing the second revision of the booklet on Indians in Wisconsin, and I would say this is, while well, my dates aren't very good, uh, hardly accurate, but somewhere around 1965, a senator from, U.S. Senator from Utah, Senator Watkins, who uh, sat on the Indian Affairs uh, Committee in the U.S. Senate, uh, took it on his own as a crusade to have the Menominee Indians forswear forever any uh, a special allegiance to the Bureau of Indian Affairs and to the U.S. government. Henceforth, he felt that the Indians were doing so well they should be treated as any other citizens. So he had all kinds of hearings, and these hearings brought out that the that the Indians kept maintaining that the U.S. government had mismanaged their affairs. Well, Watkins said, let's see if the Indians can do any better themselves. And uh, so they, they managed some kind of bribe to the Indian residents, uh, to the tribal members in which uh, they offered X amount of money, and I can't, amount, uh, can't remember what it was, but X sum of money to every man, woman, and child Menominee Indian. And if they took it, then that signified a positive vote for, uh, uh, what is it, deaccessioning or uh, 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 to, to uh, leave, there's some fancy term for it, to, to, to uh, terminate all uh, a, not allegiance, but all relationships, special relationship as Indians with the U.S. government. And so that did pass, and then that meant that the whole Menominee Indian Reservation came into the state of Wisconsin as a 73rd county. And that presented problems for the state of they Wisconsin. Oh, they, I mean, as we say, no professionals, no teachers, no, no, no kindergarten teachers, no it's just hard to imagine a, a, a county without policemen, a county without uh, lawyers or doctors or nurses. So there, there were uh, there, there, there were difficulties which lay ahead. But uh, the I must say the state of Wisconsin was splendid in its treatment and its rational help toward the Menominee Indian Reservation. At least a lot of us felt that way. Brief interruption, we proceed with the Menominee. Well, I think, Ruth, I've said quite enough, though there's more to say, uh, about the Indians in Wisconsin. I did a number of other studies for the Governor's Commission on Human Rights. Uh, among them was non-white housing in Wisconsin, and that mainly was uh, uh, housing of blacks in Milwaukee, and it uh, was an, an eye-opener again, uh, and uh, I got n a number of disagreeable incidents when I went over to interview Milwaukee city officials about the conditions, mainly in the 8th Ward in Milwaukee, uh, which, what, uh, 20, 25 years ago, uh, shouldn't have been as bad as they might even be today, but uh, uh, were, were sufficiently dreadful that uh, the, the uh, 
governmental, or city governmental officials were not willing to admit or even do much in the way of help of helping out in the housing. Uh, they had the migrant workers. They, oh, they had the migrant workers, and that was another. Who did that study? Was it Francis? There's someone did a study on the migrant workers. I know the League of Women Voters was extremely active in this field. I don't think the Governor's Commission did anything. But uh, the, the housing of the migrant workers possibly uh, a study was done either by Virginia Hart or Helen Bruner or uh, some of these women who were so active in the social issues of the day. Well, from uh, my onward and upward to, uh, about my uh, progress through Madison uh, or in Madison, because I'm not through with Madison yet, as my children got older, uh, I uh, uh, got, uh, and, and the Governor's Commission was, uh, the work there was sporadic. I only wrote when, uh, when the funds were available and when the need was very apparent to the Commission itself, and the Commission voted to establish such a study. I decided to uh, look for other work, and then I got a part-time job working half-time at the newly established Office of International Studies and Programs in the University of Wisconsin here in Madison. And this was a fascinating program. Uh, the dean had just been appointed, Dean Henry Bertram Hill, uh, who, just recently died. who just recently died in Ohio, and he uh, was uh, uh, charged with establishing a, a program uh, of a junior year program in France and with establishing various interdisciplinary study programs in, uh, in African affairs, East Asian affairs, uh, Western Europe, and so forth. And he, he did a, a wonderful job. My main responsibility was working with the junior year programs. We set up a program in Aix-en-Provence, and uh, on my own I went over there to check it out and to see that things were well done. And, and uh, That was a uh, real pioneering effort. It was a pioneering effort, and well, I think the universe, I'm glad you <laughs> emphasized that because I neglected to, but the University of Wisconsin along with the University of Michigan were just uh, about the only programs of serious academic nature in the country which were uh, situated in France and which required uh, uh, a really decent uh, academic background so that the, the student who, who enrolled, who was admitted, not enrolled, but who was admitted to a junior year program had to have at least two years of, of the language in, at the college level and had to have a, a serious high school competent, uh, background and had to pass competency tests so that, the, <laughs> so that when the students got over there after a six-week introductory period of study in the summertime, the student would then enroll in the regular university, the University of Aix-en-Provence, or later on when the program was established in Italy, the University of Bologna. And uh, they would live just as the other uh, native students did in, uh, not in dormitories for the most part, but in private homes or anywhere where they could find lodging. And uh, this is the way students live in Europe because the, the governments rarely provide, didn't in those days, uh, dormitories as we do. And they don't have campuses as we do. This is the university campus. This is our college, our Beloit campus. No, they, the university is simply a collection of buildings here and there scattered throughout the, the city wherever it's located. So that by enrolling our students in the regular universities, we were just light years ahead of any other program. The others were 
really amateurish, almost finishing school types of things. And by the time our students came home from their junior year in France or in Italy, or later on, we, we uh, not, not too, too much later on, we established the junior year in Germany, in Freiburg, uh, when our students came home, they were competent. They were competent in French or Italian or German. And this, this gives you a, a marvelous sense because you have uh, undergraduates who are entering their senior year and they are fluent in the language that they've chosen. And if they go into chemistry and they need German, they have it. Uh, this or, or uh, uh, comparative literature and they need French, they have it. And they don't have to worry about their graduate training because they have this language and they have it for life. So the, the junior year programs uh, were a great success because they and are a great success because Dean Hill started them with such serious intent. And uh, uh, by not giving any kind of academic uh, 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 favors to anyone, it, it uh, went ahead very well. At that time, Edwin Young, who had been a TA of mine in under Selig Perlman in the Labor Economics Department, Edwin Young was now Dean of Letters and Science and uh, later on became president of the university. But uh, uh, so it was Edwin Young who working with Henry Hill had, uh, had helped set up these junior year programs and had insisted on their academic excellence. Uh, I must say that I felt extremely lucky uh, uh, that uh, I got to know the university from the inside because uh, as, a, as an undergraduate and as a graduate student, uh, you don't know uh, how, how the university functions. So working uh, in, in, junior, in the junior year program, working on the interdisciplinary academic programs, I got to know uh, uh, a good number of faculty members, but I also got to know the workings of a great university and how it functions. You have to learn where the power lies. <laughs> As you know, uh, Ruth, having worked in the law school, there's, uh, there's a lot of power politics. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you're at a low level, you just view it. But it is interesting. Well, meanwhile, in uh, not meanwhile, but uh, as time progressed, uh, we're up to the 60s now. Uh, in 1967, uh, my husband, uh, in 66 and 67, had been working in with the Peace Corps in uh, in Africa, in Gabon, in Western Africa, and. Uh, also doing some work up in Tunisia with AID, the Agency for International Development, so that uh, my children were then in their middle teens, and uh, they had, had all had French in high school, so we decided, Marshall and I decided it'd be a good time to go to, uh, to uh, Europe, so uh, we packed up and, and in 1967 went off for a year in in uh, Switzerland, in the French part of Switzerland, out from uh, uh, out from Geneva, north of the uh, of the uh, or up uh, well north of the Rhone River, up in the Alps, in the mountains, and the children were put in in boarding school, and I had a chalet which they could come to on weekends, and meanwhile I learned to ski and had a, a great year off. But uh, then I came back in the summer of 67, we all came back, and it was a great, after that long sabbatical, which had been fun to read and, and learn, uh, learn to, to ski and, and do uh, far different things than I had done in Madison, then I plunged into politics and uh, uh, I had begun to be known in the village of Shorewood Hills where my husband and I had, and family had lived ever since we, we uh, built our first house in 1947. So that I was asked to run for the village board 
and I did and uh, became president of the village board, the village of Shorewood Hills, for four years. This was a wonderful experience for me because I had never had responsibility of policy making and uh, while we while we had an excellent administrator in the village it was still a small enough governmental unit so that we all worked together and uh, the president though a, a voluntary position voluntary political position nevertheless had a great deal of, of power and a great deal to say about how the village was run and uh, how many policemen we should have or, or we, how many policemen we needed and what kind of services we should provide and where we could get our money and did we pay our fair share in the, uh, in the city of Madison because we were Those and we are city that you never, did. never did pay our fair share well <clears throat> I hate to say it but until I came uh, to the village board in uh, 67 I don't think we did pay our share fair share, but one of the first things I wanted to do was insist that we have equalization of assessments and so that uh, everything would be on a, a much more equitable basis and we wouldn't receive so much from the state government in shared funds. Meanwhile, the... That must have gone over with a lot of people. In well, government. they didn't know about it. <laughs> People don't follow the ins and outs of no, government that well, but the, uh, the the I don't know if you were in the school board at that time, but the school board eventually, in this late 60s, took over the entire uh, jurisdiction of all the the surrounding yeah. schools, yeah. so that uh, the school district is far bigger and totally equitable in a sense, mm -hmm. uh, far bigger than the city of Madison, which uh, does have Maple Bluff and Shorewood as mm -hmm. islands in their midst. But uh, uh, so that the school budget is greater than the uh, governmental budget of either the city of Madison or of course mm -hmm. the villages. Uh, so. Uh, in, in this way, we also were aided in uh, paying our fair share because we all paid for a part of the mm -hmm. school district, uh, whether you're a Mohican Pass as you are or uh, on Circle Close as I am, it's all the same uh, school tax. It resulted uh, actually in the marvelous school at Charlotte Hills has had over the years. Uh, that's true, but it's also because we uh, and you have to pay for the, uh, mainly for the city, uh, for the uh, university housing of the Eagle Heights and the university housing of, of junior faculty members and uh, students uh, who are within that district. But as you say, the village of Shorewood Hills got a bonus because uh, uh, the, the few children we had who were in the uh, uh, kindergarten through fifth grades were given excellent educations because we had so many uh, y United Nations, uh, uh, such a, uh, a great United Nations influx of students uh, that uh, we, we did get friend, an excellent education for our kids. Really, uh, uh, well, the one she was a teacher, and when I, she was going around looking at sites and so on. The one thing she wanted to see was the, the Shorewood School because he had heard in Japan about what a wonderful school it was. Well, the village of Shorewood Hills cannot take credit for that. You can take credit for that, but also it's an incidental aspect of the yeah. fact that we have so many different uh, varieties of, of, peop of people there. Well, then in 1975, now that uh, my uh, Re recounting of, of what's happened during these years has gotten out of the 60s and up to the 70s. Uh, while I was still president of the village, uh, Governor Lucy, Democratic governor uh, here in Wisconsin, uh, called me up one day and asked me if I'd be willing to accept appointment to the Board of Regents. Well, 
I think I, uh, I uh, made some kind of response that uh, probably was heard all the way down to the Capitol. That, uh, uh, of, course. of course, I would. It's and, the one uh, appointment nobody turns down. No, uh, absolutely not. Though I do recall that David Carley hoped he would get something else even bigger, so he resigned from the Board of Regents when uh, Lucy had put him on. But that was a few years earlier, I believe. Did you take David Carley's place? No, no, I did not. Uh, I took a Republican's place. Oh, I know who I, I took, uh, uh, Walter Rank's place. Mm. And uh, he's never uh, been kind of frank, uh, friendly toward me since then, because for some reason, he was hoping to be reappointed, and he is a, a very staunch conservative Republican, and it's hardly likely that a liberal Democrat, as Pat Lucy is, mm -hmm. would uh, appoint him. But uh, I was a fine choice for Pat, in as much as uh, I had known him, I had known him and his wife Jeannie for a long time, and. When he was working in the DOC, though he came much later than mm -hmm. Jim, yeah. uh, came over from uh, Crawford, County. Crawford County, from the western part of the state, he uh, uh, was often, his, his wife Jeannie and I were often working together in the office, uh, mm -hmm. stapling uh, uh, various missives together. Well, at any rate, uh, at any rate uh, my seven year term on the Board of Regents was uh, an absolute delight in many, many ways. Unlike most of my fellow Regents who were workers, who were full-time uh, people uh, who had jobs elsewhere, uh, mainly men, uh, I did, uh, this was my first responsibility as a member of the full, uh, of the Board of Regents and I had no other job and I did, uh, I made it my uh, my full-time job, I did all the background reading. I talked to as many faculty and administrators and chancellors uh, as I could because I wanted to learn what the UW system was just about. Now, this was a time, 1975, if you remember, Ruth, when Governor Lucy had just uh, instituted and put through, uh, by virtue of his strong leadership, had put through merger in the Wisconsin legislature, and this was merger of all the state higher educational institutions, public higher educational institutions, into one system. A very controversial idea. Extremely controversial. From Pat Lucy's standpoint, and from a number of uh, mainly Democratic legislators, some Republican, it it had its, its good points because it meant that all the state universities, the state teachers' colleges, which were then called state colleges, they had been promoted from teachers' colleges to state colleges, would not come down one by one to Madison and go to the various legislators and plead for money and demand money and lobby for money and compete against one another. And every legislator had a had a teacher's college in his district. Every legislator did. There and there were not only these teacher teachers colleges, but there were the four year institute uh, two year institutions. The teachers colleges were four year, and there were uh, there were no graduate institutions. Though I may be wrong about Milwaukee, but Milwaukee was a, was a a teacher's college, but it might have offered another year or so and given an MA, but no one offered uh, a, a doctorate, in, in, and not one of the schools still does. But in addition to the 13 four-year schools, there were 14 two-year schools, which uh, were, ex they forgotten their name, but they were extensions. They, they, yeah, they, they were university extension from, they, that's right, they had developed from Madison for the most part. President Harrington was a great two-year college. Two-year colleges had been a, a marvelous thing for the, for uh, 
people throughout the state, I think. Uh, I think m most of us agree that the two-year colleges are wonderful. But uh, this period of, of merger, two years, uh, I came on the Board of Regents two years after merger was in instituted, it uh, meant that, uh, well, it resulted in Madison almost unanimously feeling very bitter against Lucy and very upset about merger. Madison faculty, Madison administrators felt that by being put under the same umbrella as the four-year teachers' colleges, Madison, a world-famous, a world-class research institution, would be brought down to the level of these somewhat mediocre teachers' colleges. And uh, there, there was such a debate on this subject, uh, but uh, th there were two sides to this, not only the side of the competition for the, the, the very limited since April 16, 1991, and we're preparing a second tape and doing an interview with Joyce Erdman today. There was some difficulty with the other tape that we made last week. talk to Joyce, with Joyce, about her experience as a member of the Board of Regents at the University of Wisconsin. Good morning, Joyce. Good morning. You talked the other day about other phases of your career, but we need to go over again your activities in seven years on the Board of Regents at the University of Wisconsin. It's a much sought after appointed position by the government. Is that you're the only one the only woman? Were you the only woman? No, uh, there have been other women. I was the only woman at the time I was appointed, however. Mm -hmm. uh, Pat Lucy appointed me in 1975, and uh, this was just after the merger legislation had taken place in the state of Wisconsin. And because it's such a controversial piece of legislation, I might uh, talk a bit about uh, the implications of it and the feelings at the time. Yes. Oh, excuse me. Merger was the unification of all the publicly financed colleges and universities under a single system of administration and education in the state of Wisconsin. Merger was, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, a combination of the state teachers' colleges, which were located all over uh, the state, which had become four-year colleges, which were four-year colleges but without graduate programs. And the extension, the 14 extension, two-year extension schools, which were throughout Wisconsin again, and which offered academic programs leading toward uh, a, uh, not a bachelor's degree, but a two-year degree, uh, but with the option of transferring to a four-year school. And the third uh, institution which was put under the merger merge system was the University of Wisconsin here at Madison, which was called the University of Wisconsin. So that with merger, from a standpoint of nomenclature, all the schools, all the four-year schools became known as the University of Wisconsin dash and the city in which they were located. University of Wisconsin Platteville, University of Wisconsin Superior, University of Wisconsin Madison. Now Madison was, the, the faculty of Madison and those associated with 
the University of Wisconsin, Madison, were generally uh, very strongly opposed to the merger legislation because the alumni and the faculty, the general academic community, felt that merger would cause mediocrity to bloom at Wisconsin. That uh, Madison, one of the world-class universities, great research and graduate institution, known in every community, uh, almost every community of the civilized and third world nation, would become a just another school uh, and would be brought down to a level that would, would hardly uh, be the kind of thing that everyone was so proud of. So uh, th there was a strong opposition from a very wide community. Those who favored a favored merger were uh, the leader, for example, Pat Lucy, the governor at the time, who felt that the competition in the state legislature every two years for biennial budget appropriation were so uh, so stultifying, so difficult, so competitive, and so uh, uh, so uh, so bad for the whole state of Wisconsin because there is a finite a matter, a, amount of money that can be raised uh, from the taxpayer. The budget is at one point limited. And here, uh, the strongest schools were able to get more money and uh, less mo less, a lesser budget was left for those who uh, didn't have strong assemblymen or senators in the state legislature who were not able to fight for them as much as might be. Uh, the, the other thing, uh, the, the other aspect of merger was that Governor Lucy felt there was, because of this lack of strength of some of the uh, smaller schools, that the students, the young people of the state of Wisconsin were not receiving the adequate education they should. Students who lived up in, in Green Bay didn't have a four-year school near them. Students who lived in Stevens Point had a smaller school as those in, in Platteville or in La Crosse or uh, uh, River Falls. They had schools that were not, uh, frankly, high in academic standards and uh, didn't have a wide offering. Therefore, they competed with each other too. They competed with each other, with Madison, with the extension schools. They had different different levels of entry, and yet they had their own graduate program. Well, they didn't have many graduate programs. They gave them a master's degree for uh, handwriting. A few program. did. They they had uh, they had degrees that any academic uh, uh, who who was knowledgeable at all knew was not a first-rate certificate. So that recognizing that all these young people in the state of Wisconsin basically have a, a similar desire for advancement, a similar motivation. They aren't more motivated in southern Wisconsin they are, than they are in northern Wisconsin. Uh, we have some of our finest uh, outstanding uh, people who made national and international names for themselves have come from little towns all over our state. So we need we needed then uh, a greater equality of educational opportunity, and this is what Governor Lucy was pushing for, and what I uh, believed in very strongly would come about with merger. Merger was difficult, and there there was this great opposition to it from Madison, but. Uh, having served on the Board of Regents in those early years when merger was being implemented, I saw the uh, really magnificent changes that came about because of it. More money was spent in administration, but 
the decisions that were made for educational, uh, for the uh, different schools, for educational advancement here and there, were made by academic faculty, people who knew the educational problems. They weren't made by fighting in the state legislature. So that every two years, the system administration, the system, pre system president, and the system board of regents, which was our board of regents, presented to the legislature a unified budget. With well, can I yes, just of course second? you may. Uh, the, uh, the membership on the board of regents was a unified group that included. There was an amalgamation of all the other. Uh, there was the board of regents of the state university, and then there was. Yes, and they did, uh, uh, Pat Lucy did bring in uh, many of these people, and even today, any governor who makes appointments to the Board of Regents makes sure that he has, cons that he has representation uh, as much as possible from every corner of the state, so that uh, if, if you appoint someone from northern Wisconsin while he that he or she does not necessarily represent the University of Wisconsin as superior, that person uh, is, knows the area and knows the special problems up there. Uh, uh, but as I discovered very soon on the Unified Board of Regents, this, this group of 17 people represent the state system and they represent the welfare of the students all over the state of Wisconsin and the welfare of these schools. Now what merger did, it, it began to realize the hopes of the governor and those of us who were for merger and it did not realize, it did not bring about the fears of those people who uh, felt that Madison would turn into a second-rate school. Yeah, what about Milwaukee? And the uh, Milwaukee was... Uh, Yes, Milwaukee was a part of the state system, and the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee now has a graduate program, a very good graduate program, and uh, uh, its, its special mission is to, fill, to fulfill urban education. The, and, and as I use the word mission, uh, with system, the regents and the administration tried to ensure that every school in the state system had a special mission. Madison's was obviously a continuation of its strong research and graduate program. But uh, the, the new, uh, a new school was built at Green Bay and it was to, uh, to provide a environmental offerings to all the young people throughout the state who wanted environmental education and ecological uh, uh, courses so that it, uh, Green Bay is strong in uh, the biological uh, and, and earth sciences uh, and, and is, a, is, is a serious school, not just uh, environmental uh, uh, offerings that might be considered somewhat uh, easy or, or not serious. No, this is, a, a, a Green Bay is a very serious in its environmental offerings. La Crosse was, was given the mission of emphasizing a strength that they already had, which was physical education and the whole area there. Uh, up in Menominee, the uh, Stout has uh, two, two missions that they uh, offer today. One is special education for those who are disabled and how to educate them, and a hotel, uh, an odd combination, but hotel and food management. So that Stout is w one of the major schools in the country offering hotel management. It, it rivals uh, uh, some of the school, uh, what is it, Michigan State, which I believe has a, Cornell. and Cornell has an, a, has a well-known hotel management school. So every school was given a special mission and helped to determine its own mission. Further, 
duplication of courses which were not uh, outstanding, which were not uh, those that could be well offered by the different schools, were began to be el uh, eliminated and recommended for elimination. So that, for example, medical technology was offered at almost every school, every one of the 13 four-year institutions. Now, medical technology has to have extensive undergraduate courses and internships at hospitals, and you have to have hospitals with, with well-equipped laboratories. And This is not just a, a, a survey course of a year or two. So that the Board of Regents recommended after two years of intensive study that several of the something like four or five of the medical technology courses be eliminated and more funds, more money be devoted to the uh, schools which were left with stronger courses. The, the cry <laughs> that came up from legislators and lobbyists and people all over the state was really quite surprising, but possibly not surprising. At any rate, it was extremely loud and vociferous and uh, in due time, the the recommendation of the Board of Regents of the Board of Regents was passed, but it was without this very strong opposition, and I uh, suppose it could have been anticipated. But at any rate, this was the kind of decision to eliminate technology at these schools was the kind of decision that should be made only by academic personnel who were experts and who knew what the requirements should be for outstanding programs. So in the end, what you had was a no diminution of the academic excellence at Madison, a, an enormous increase in academic excellence at the other institutions, because more and more we the system began to require that faculty members have doctorates. So many of them were only BAs or MAs, mm -hmm. and uh, they should they should have good educations. Where did where did most of these academics come from? Who then began to teach at the at the various schools? They came from Madison. They came from. Uh, our own school, and uh, this was a further link of the, and a further characteristic that helped unify the system, so that Madison no longer looked down on Platteville or Stevens Point or any or, uh, Parkside, any of these other schools. They began to realize that these are our own students who are carrying forth a strong educational message. And this is one of the great things that, that made merger possible. Instead of uh, each tiny in enrollment, they've all grown. And our university, which was supposed to dry up and go away with the competition from other institutions, has grown so that it's uh, alarming now. It is alarming, but it's alarming in a good sense. and. Uh, uh, I, I think the, the chancellor at Madison is uh, taking appropriate steps to increase the academic requirements for uh, high school students who plan on entering uh, Madison. And uh, the other schools uh, have their own different requirements so that one can go to a school in the state. I haven't said much about, and I know you you uh, know more about the two, or you know quite a bit about the two-year extension system, Ruth. Uh, but the, the two-year extension system was under, originally under Madison. This is uh, where it got its beginning. And these extension schools uh, located all over are marvelous preparatory schools for uh, later entering the university here in Madison because a, a student, number one, a student can stay home uh, and go to school. The costs are much less. Number two, the enrollment is much smaller, and yet the faculty uh, all has doctorates, 
uh, all the members of the faculty had their PhDs, and they are competent educational personnel. But the surrounding, the ambiance is small and, and inviting. The schools are very nice. They have little campuses. They don't have dormitories, but the, their enrollment comes from, well, I would say, something like a 30 or 40, 50 mile radius at the most. And uh, it, though in some cases, it's true, I've heard that students will come and get little apartments or get uh, home, uh, get rooms in homes uh, of these little towns and then uh, uh, go to school and go home on the weekends. But uh, these students from the two-year institutions then come to Madison where you are awed by an enormous campus uh, uh, of such size that it is that you can't begin to know more than a few people in your own classrooms and in your own dormitory and it is much harder to establish a social system whereas in the two-year schools you know everybody and it's uh, it's a great deal of fun in the college sense at any rate these two-year schools uh, are are notable uh, two-year successes because when their students transfer to Madison or to the other four-year institutions, they do just as well, if not better, than the students who have had the, their training their freshman and sophomore years at the uh, four-year school. So uh, I, I am giving probably a one-sided picture of merger, but overall I'm, I'm, I'm proud of it. I think uh, it's been such a success that many other states have now come to Madison and have copied and have made studies of the Wisconsin system because it has done what it said it would do. It's lessened the cutthroat competition for funds. It's put that competition into the educational system where it belongs. And number two, it's provided equal educational opportunity for all students throughout our state. Is it true that uh, there are almost as many juniors entering this uh, Madison campus as, uh, as freshmen because of the transfers from, from the smaller institutions? Okay. And that, uh, that is an interesting point, and I'm sure it is true, Ruth, uh, but I hadn't read that. Uh, I don't know that, that's a, a, a statistic I don't know about, but I would suspect it's very true. And uh, if it is, and I think you're right, then uh, that is a, another reason why the... One of the great cost cutters. Yes, one of the great cost cutters for the students and for the state itself, because the, the, the two-year extension schools uh, are not costly schools. Uh, another thing that I think people who listen to you 100 years from now or 50 years from now would be interested in is the, um, the fact that, uh, oh, I forgot my Well, your students just left to go, <laughs> to, go to school. <laughs> 100, uh, 125,000 students in the University of Wisconsin system. Right. Which makes it one of the most highly educated states in the Union, I imagine. California probably exceeds us, mm -hmm. but New York, and yeah. in, in New York, but I I didn't uh, mention New York because uh, uh, well there are two systems in New York the New York uh, state system and the uh, city city college of New York which is an enormous system, but uh, certainly Wisconsin is the biggest system with the least amount of money least amount of of uh, of largesse of economic development from the taxpayers. We here in Wisconsin, uh, the the university budget is the biggest. Is the uh, aside from the state budget and so forth, is the biggest budget presented to the to the uh, legislature. And uh, fortunately, this year in 1990. A 
This is September 27, 1990. I moved Doyle. take too long. I am involved with a number of, of organizations associated with the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And these probably are, these invitations to join these groups were probably a direct result of my uh, association with the university as a member of the Board of Regents. I, I'm a uh, a member of the Clinical Cancer Center Advisory Board. This is under Paul Carbone and a number of others over in the University Hospital. I'm a member, but, and I am active in that group. I'm on the executive committee. I just went off the board of the Friends of the School of Business and was extremely active in that and helping to raise money. I do they did a wonderful job. Yes, they did a splendid job. I do remember our executive committee was having a dinner on a cold, windy, gloomy night out at our farm, and we were talking about how we could get a decent new school of business. And we came up with the idea of raising money uh, on a private basis and then trying to bribe, as it were, the state legislature with this private money we had raised for a public institution. And we said, well, maybe we could raise four million dollars. And I must say, there had been a little wine uh, at the dinner, and someone yeah, said, well, yes, possibly five. And I think it was I who said, well, I think we can raise six million dollars. Well, when the final tally was made about six months ago, we raised $35 million for the School of Business. And we're giving not all that to construction, obviously, but, most, most, but some to construction, but most of it for special academic chairs and institutes within the School of Business. We don't have a highly ranked school of business at Wisconsin now, and we want to be better academically. I, I am on the, let's see, I'm a member of the Friends of the Memorial Library. I'm not active in that. But I am uh, a member uh, and uh, go to the board meetings regularly of the Memorial Union. And this is a marvelous group of people who work with Ted Crabb, the executive director, in promoting the Memorial Union as the living room of the university. Outside of the university, I'm a member of a, a woman's group called Attic Angels. I'm a member of the Madison Art Center. I just was past president of the center for two years and uh, still sit on the board. And uh, currently, I'm very active in the Ice Age Trail and Foundation of the state of Wisconsin. This is a group trying to, to raise money and to plot, we've already plotted out the uh, path of the, of the great glacier, the last glacier that descended on Wisconsin and we want to make a trail similar to the Appalachian Trail. And one of our former members of Congress, Henry Royce, 
supported and advocated this uh, federal legislation which set up Wisconsin as a federally blessed but not financed uh, ice age trail so that we would uh, have the status of federal approval, federal blessing as it were, but not federal funds. So that kind of thing did go through the U.S. Congress when Henry Royce was in Congress a number of years ago, but uh, it still needs, uh, still requires that we uh, uh, get the land and buy it from the private landowners and then build and maintain these trails. And that is a challenging job in which I'm very active in. So I th it is wonderful fun. It's nice to be in, to be involved in something that you believe in. Though I uh, have never joined a group in which I didn't think the cause was just. At any rate, that covers my major groups. Are you on the board of the Madison Community Foundation? I was. I was one of the founding members of the Madison Community Foundation, and that is a splendid group. Just received fourteen million dollars from one of our past community leaders or business leaders in Madison who, who died not so long ago. Uh, the Community Foundation, is, as you well know, Ruth, is a excellent group which is setting up a foundation, an ongoing perpetual foundation similar to the University of Wisconsin Foundation, which will promote in a general way and an ongoing way all the good causes, the needed causes, to make Madison a better place in which to live. That takes care of it, Ruth, That's and thank wonderful. you very much. Yes, uh, I'm, I'm happy to continue because I felt very strongly about this subject. I felt that what merger did in addition to prevent the uh, financial quibbling and, comp and competition in the legislature itself for a finite dollar, it also meant that the students throughout Wisconsin, whether they lived in River Falls or in Green Bay or anywhere, they would have equal access to quality education. And after all, one must remember that almost all the faculty members that we have in these, thir in these 13 four-year institutions and in the 14 and in the 13 two-year institutions, one of the extension schools uh, was uh, dropped out. Uh, so we have 26 institutions of higher education. Which is probably more than any other state in the union, right? It's possible. Uh, we, were, we were one of the uh, sec w one of the first two systems throughout the country. Uh, only uh, California well, uh, uh, was ahead of us in establishing a system, and then uh, New York came very shortly after Wisconsin. But we uh, we we provided quality education for all these children, and we ensured that their faculty members came, generally speaking, uh, with PhDs from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, so that it was an ideal situation. The student, the teachers' colleges had generally not had uh, uh, faculty with doctorates, and now the faculty throughout the system had doctorates, and the doctorates for the most part came from one of the best schools in the world, the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So as years have gone by, I think merger has been a benefit, certainly to every student in the state, because it's meant if, if you live in La Crosse, you can get an education there without leaving home. I mean, you live in that area. This is a wonderful thing. And uh, if you live in Menominee, in the middle of the state, 
you can study hotel management or, uh, or food service, something of that nature, and it's one of the best in the country. Only uh, Michigan is ahead of us, greatly ahead of us in hotel management. So we really, I think, have one of the finest systems in the country. I think we're saving money because each of our smaller schools has its own special expertise, and I think we're giving our the children, our students in Wisconsin, the equal access to fine education. And this is a great thing. And I'm threatened that the University in Madison would disappear. <laughs> and it hasn't been, but the enrollment has gone up and up and up. The enrollment's gone up too high, and now Chancellor Donna Shalala is trying to keep it down, which uh, I think she should, and, and uh, which she's uh, succeeding in doing. Nevertheless, we are admitting uh, almost exclusively Wisconsin students to uh, Madison because they're so well qualified. And so many of them are, uh, have had two years at uh, Exactly. At, at the uh, extension, uh, at, at the two-year extension institutions or often they transfer from the four-year uh, bigger schools. But if, if they go to Stevens Point, for example, and transfer down to Madison. It's an ideal kind of solution for that student who lives in the Stevens Point area because he or she gets accustomed to a smaller school, and Stevens Point isn't small, it must be about eight, 9,000 a day, but then it comes down to Madison, which is enormous, but the student finds his way and understands what a serious academic institution is about. Anyone who graduates from the University of Wisconsin Madison or the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point is respected throughout the United States. Well, as as a member of the Board of Regents, uh, after a few years, I was elected as president of the board, and this was great. Was a, a great challenge for me. It was a, a, a period of great excitement because. Uh, I was the first woman, and uh, the, the power struggle that goes on with some of these uh, members of the board uh, well, was uh, uh, quite a new experience to me, and the fact that this meant so much to them, that membership in the board meant a great deal to them, and uh, uh, achieving the presidency meant, meant even more on a political or power standpoint uh, was a very impressive factor. Uh, that I discovered. But uh, by being president, I was able to work with the uh, presidents of the board, and we had hired uh, Robert O'Neill as uh, our head of the UW system. And I, I found that uh, I could work very closely with the president, and uh, we, we agreed in many things, and we, we could in a sense, uh, help make policy together. And uh, so that I traveled throughout the state and I talked to chancellors and I held hands with top administrators. And I, I worked in a number of studies. Uh, one that I remember very clearly was trying to prevent the, uh, the revolving door aspect of the black students who we, we tried so hard to get more black students to attend, but uh, frequently in Wisconsin, our finest black students were lured away, this is still happening today, were lured away to Eastern schools, to, to Harvard, to Dartmouth, anywhere where they're given big fellowships and uh, big scholarships and our and so our own Wisconsin native students who get the finest uh, education in our high schools go off to other states and we meanwhile need to show that we have more black students and we have to get black students who aren't as poorly prepared and they would often come from Chicago. So we did have a serious problem with retention and with preparation of our minority students. Uh, but everyone makes his own small contribution, and I'm sure that every region, uh, including myself, uh, uh, thinks uh, that uh, uh, that uh, he or she has made a contribution. Uh, 
Well, when the uh, term of the uh, is my uh, on the Board of Regents expired, there was a, a, a Republican governor, so it was clear that I was not and going. Writing was up <laughs> it was very clear that I was not going to be reappointed, and uh, uh, I, I I think it's just as good because it's it's while I would have enjoyed another term. It's seriously, it's much better to spread this kind of, of, of relationship around to, wide, to as wide an audience, as to as wide a, a number of taxpayers as one can in the, in the state of Wisconsin, where we pride ourselves in our dem democratic approaches. So that uh, today I'm, I'm still active in various aspects of university work. I'm on the board of visitors of the business school and I'm very active in fundraising for the building of a new building, the acquisition of funds for a new building for the school. I've been on the UW Clinical Cancer Center Advisory Board. I've been in a number of, of groups that are, are associated with the university and I like them. I, I feel that this is a contribution I can make and it, it extremely enjoyable. So uh, it seems that uh, today I'm in every fundraising group, also non-university uh, non in the state, but it's, uh, it's good to take it a little easier. And I want to thank you for this opportunity to talk in such extensive a fashion. I want to thank you for talking in such an extensive fashion. You can tell, you know, I have been in the I uh, had some, some long, long interviews. This is one of the long ones. Uh,